things to bring to your attention. Uh, first of all, wonderful homecoming last week. I thank you for your generosity and giving. Uh, we've taken in over $16,000 for our homecoming. Uh, we are excited about that, and that, that, that's a big chunk uh, going towards that $38,000 bill. So we're, we're very happy for that, and I appreciate all of you for giving. And uh, as any Baptist pastor will tell you, it ain't too late. Give more. more. Uh, but, but, you know, feel free to come on. A uh, couple of, uh, well, one other real important thing, and that is that uh, the uh, Christmas pageant is, is practicing at 5 o'clock today, but today is about the speaking parts. So if you're involved with the speaking parts, uh, please be here at 5 o'clock if you would, uh, Pat Joe, and you can be here for that. So please make sure that you're aware of doing that. Uh, other announcements, I'll let you kind of look there for yourselves. Uh, we're soon to be on Operation Christmas Child Moment, so uh, be prepared for that. Uh, we'll be talking about it here in just a little bit in our worship time. So prepare yourselves as we get ready to worship our Lord here on this day when you got an extra hour. We praise God for all good gifts. <laughs> to all let us enter the worship of our Lord here this morning at Chatham Heights. Would you please rise to your feet if you are able. Join me in our call to worship that is in your bulletin. We ask God not to be with us today but to help us be where God is today. Let us profess with our mouths the true disciples prayer. That our families our church, ourselves, would be a part of what God is blessing. It is God's revelation of divine activities that is our invitation to join in the blessing. Let us keep watch to see where God is working. Let's bow together. Lord, indeed, we come before you and we wish to be where you are, O oh Lord, so that your spirit would move within us and among us, particularly as we worship you now. So bless this hour with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to continue in worship as we sing, Sing to the King.
reading comes from 2 Thessalonians, um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and then we'll go on down to, uh, to verses 13 through 17. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. boxes, you have never seen such pure joy. This is amazing as you can see the children's faces, they are excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just the child, but the whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. It is that time of year again for us here at Chatham Heights Baptist Church. Our young people and adults who wish to join us this Wednesday evening, the Fellowship Hall, between 6 and 8 p.m., we will be downstairs in the Fellowship Hall packing shoe boxes. So please join us here this Wednesday night at that, whether you're young or even a little more on the mature end of things. It's always an exciting time. We'll be packing those shoe boxes Wednesday evening and then uh, next Sunday will be our in-gathering. If you would like to take home some shoe boxes, there are plenty here. There are also plenty in each Sunday school room, if I'm not mistaken, that we put them out there. This year, Susan Dove and Susan Hampton are coordinating our efforts with OCC. And once again this year, we are the one of the regional collection sites here in the area. Uh, the collection week begins on Monday the 14th and goes all the way to the next Monday, the 21st. And on your insert in the bulletin, you can find out all the more that you need, including some items that are usually uh, looked upon with great favor to be included in your shoe boxes as well. So let us remember this time of the year, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and the way in which uh, we can be connected to ministry and missions beyond, <coughs> I don't know what happened there, David. Uh, beyond our uh, beyond ourselves and to other places that we will never see. I'm going to ask if Carolyn McCraw would come up at this time. The pastor's watching me as I try to look graceful stepping through cords, but anyway. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's a <coughs> pleasure to see you. Everybody got a lot more sleep, right, last night, and here on time, or else you've been here a long time. But it's my privilege, and I hope you've seen this in our bulletin, that today and every day, we want to honor our associate minister, David Cameron, who has been with us for 21 years years, his anniversary, and beginning his 22nd year. 
We are so blessed, so fortunate to have staff members, and if you look down a little bit further, Israel has been with us for 22 years, who all have put up with us for that many years. And you know how Baptist can be. We have many varied opinions about most topics. And so they kindly listen, as does David. Not only does he plan the music program for the choir, but for the congregation. And this has not been easy, especially since we now have one service. Many of you are so enjoying the praise songs. The rest of us may be a little bit more traditional, but we like the praise songs too. But he tries to, to walk a tight rope to hopefully please everyone. And that's not always an easy job, and he does it with a lot of grace. Not only does he take care of our music ministry, but also he helps a great deal with our live streaming, our videos. And whenever we want something special for the front of our bulletins, he is a whiz on the computer. He knows that I am not, so I can quickly go to him and he can bring up different things from which we can choose. David is indeed a person who loves this church. He's got dual role now, as you know. He travels to First Baptist to be their music minister. And when I talk to David on occasion about, because that's not an easy job, and he <laughs> mentions one thing that he misses is being able to see you more frequently at the end of worship services. You see his coattail flying as he heads out the side door to get to First Baptist so that he can help with their music program. So this is a man with a heart of love whom I value highly, and I know you do also. Let's give him a round of love for what he has done for Chatham. Someone said speech, speech. So I think I've taken all the time, haven't I, David? Thank you, everybody. And when you have a chance to speak to Israel, thank him as well. We call on him to do so many things that many times it's hard for him to get his regular routine accomplished. So as I said, we are richly blessed here at Chatham Heights Baptist Church. And you have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you all. I invite you to stand as we sing our offertory hymn number 469. Revive us again, number 469. <laughs>
I love doing that. <laughs> Good morning. At least I got you laughing this morning. As we enter this month that we set aside as Thanksgiving, may we always have a heart of Thanksgiving to others, whether it's here at the church, whether it's in our neighborhood, at work, wherever we may be, may we have a spirit of thanksgiving. I noticed those of you on Facebook along with me and Mike and the rest of us, a lot of people take the month of November and take each day and list on Facebook something they're thankful for. I challenge you to do that each and every day of the year, not just November. May we, as God's people, always be thankful for the blessings that he pours out upon us. Let us pray. Father, we again come to you and say thank you. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for getting us through another day. Now, Father, I just ask that you would take this offering. May this church use it to give you the thanks, to give you the praise. And all that we accomplish, we give it to you. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is time for our children's moment. Children would like to come down. Join me down front. Come on. We'll sit here with you guys today, right up here. Excitement abounds. Good to see everyone here this morning. 
Now find a seat. You can sit right here if you can. Would you like to sit right here? Here we go. There we go. We are doing something today special in our worship service. We do it usually at the first of every month. Do you recognize things on the table here? Do you know what's on here? This is the Lord's Supper, right? What are the two things that we take from the Lord's Supper? The, the bread, right? Does anybody remember what the bread represents? The body of Christ, okay, broken for us. And then there's the cup, right? And what does that represent? Jesus' blood? That's right, Jesus' blood, huh? Yeah, yeah. A golden cup, very similar. Yeah, it looks gold and there's cups in it, right? And there is, you know, this represents or reminds us of Jesus' blood because Jesus died for us. He gave his life so that we could live forever with him. Now, I want us to remember that we do this, we remember this not just once a month, but we should remember this a lot in our lives, shouldn't we? How much God loves us that he sends his son Jesus to die for us. So we are going to remember that today in a special way. Let's bow together and let's have prayer. Let's have prayer together. Lord, I thank you so much that you loved us enough to send your son Jesus. Remind each of us, Lord, of that thing every day. Amen. Now, our children's church group is going with Miss Susan today. Can you all go with Miss Susan? There we go. Thank you. Carolyn stole my bulletin a while ago. Can't trust these people, man. Our scripture is coming from an interesting place. It is coming from the prophet Haggai in the Old Testament, looking together towards the, end, the very end of the first chapter and then into the second chapter, the first nine verses of it. Um... This is the word of the Lord, that on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king, on the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheotil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying this, Who is left among you? who saw this temple in its former glory. And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozak, the high priest, and all you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst, so do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. And I will shake the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. For the silver is mine and the gold is mine declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give you peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand and join as we sing of Christ our cornerstone. trust the sweetest frame 
but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord. darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Christ alone Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. I'm certain that my more mature listeners may have immediately broke into a, a 60s song when reading this title, for I know that I did when I thought of it. It was a song that was made popular by a female artist with a lament of what used to be. The, the uh, verse went something like this, Just tonight I stood before the tavern. Nothing seemed the way it used to be. In the glass I saw a strange reflection. Was that lonely woman really me? Those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. We'd sing and dance forever and a day. We'd live the life we choose. We'd fight the fight and never lose. Those were the days. Haggai is from the time after the Jews had returned from their homeland following the exile in Babylon. 
the Babylonian army had previously overrun Jerusalem and took them into captivity, and in doing so, had destroyed the temple, the one that King Solomon had built. The returning Hebrews had finally constructed a replacement temple under the urging of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. But it was a modest structure which compared to the first one looked sorely out of place. And one of the problems that Haggai addresses in this passage is how those who remembered the former temple with all of its majestic appointments and accoutrements and envision what God could do for them now with only the basic work on the new temple done. Basically, Haggai says to the people, who is left among you who saw this house and its former glory? Well, the truth is, there probably weren't many. <laughs> they have been gone for a long time. One of the things they forgot, and we might not recall as well, is that it was not the materials of construction, nor the people who got it done like Solomon. It was the Spirit of God that had brought the true glory to the old temple. Indeed, this temple that would be completed in this time frame was completed about 516 B.C. It stood nearly 600 years in fact, it would be Herod, yes, that Herod, who a long time later would make it even grander in many ways than the temple of Solomon had been. That wasn't until the Romans came in 70. And they destroyed it while putting down the Jewish rebellion and basically took everything of value with them out and back to the Roman coffers. According to information gathered by LifeWay Research about Protestant churches in our country, there were about three new churches that were launched in 2019. We do not have anything really concrete for the last three years. Because at the same time, even in 2019, as 3,000 churches were begun, 4,500 churches were all but closed. Those figures were before COVID came around. We don't have complete numbers now, at least yet. So before we think of a guy speaks only to the ancients, it might do us well to recognize that perhaps there is a word here for us in our own world and life. Now the Hebrew word, root of the prophet's name is hach, which means to make a pilgrimage, a hajj, you've probably heard before from that part of the world. The goal of every pilgrimage in ancient Judea was one place, and that was the temple in Jerusalem. But as we've already said, it was gone. So it's no coincidence that, you know, Haggai reflects in today's reading that it's important that we reconstruct the temple into something greater than we have already even though we don't look like we did way back when. The truth of the matter is that they have started putting the temple back together. Zerubbabel, who is the leader now, took place, we're told, in the seventh month, this reading of Haggai to them on the 21st day of the month. In one of those rare times in Scripture, we can figure out and pinpoint exactly when this guy was talking just based on the history of the people mentioned. So it is somewhere around October 520 B.C. So a few years since now. But anyone who could respond affirmatively to the opening question, does anyone remember the glory? They had to have been at least 73 years old probably. Because not many could have survived to that age under the conditions of destruction and deportation, exile, and return. So basically, everybody doesn't remember the way it used to be. They don't. The prophet acknowledges, as a good prophet will do, that the temple's present condition is as nothing compared to its former glorious state. It would take five more years for this particular temple to be completed in Zerubbabel's time, by which time Haggai was no longer a prophet that we know of. 
The prophet didn't really live to see, it seems, the, pro the temple's completion. But his job was to refocus them, to recognize that the temple hasn't ended. It's a new time in the temple. His job is to remind them that there is something important here that we don't just lament about those days gone by or that idea of those were the days, my friends, we thought they'd never end. Because in life they do. And in history they do. But through this prophet, God reveals to us that God doesn't finish. God isn't done. God is still at work. In fact, he references in verse 5, uh, the promise which I made when you came to Egypt that my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. Well, the reference to the spirit of God there is that same word that shows itself throughout the Old Testament in Hebrew. The word ruach, the breath, the wind of God. You see, the wind of God is an animating force. It, it, it makes things that don't exist exist. It makes things that aren't alive become alive. And in the current context of what was going on, Haggai was saying, God's Spirit is still making you and I and God's work alive. Can we not say the same about ourselves? Is not God still working to make God's kingdom alive? Is God finished? No. Is God finished with, with what we may remember? Who knows? But God is still at work. God is still working on us, left and right, if you will. We can never hope to rebuild anything without the creative, powerful breath of the Ruach of God. So when we say to ourselves, we want to grow the church, we want to reach out to people here, in our community and in the kingdom of God, then we need to recognize and understand it is only God's movement that will allow such things to come to fruition. But we can decide instead, like the character in that song that I quoted you a moment ago, to sit and only reminisce about the glory that was. Or we can get up and we can give our best effort to instill the Spirit of God that God is not finished with us yet. We can sit and lament the former glory. Or we can do something. One of those novellas that Stephen King developed in his writings and then later was turned into a bigger motion picture than the novella really was, Shawshank Redemption. There is that wonderful moment in time when we are taught a lesson. As Andy Dufresne, the main character, realizes that all those years in prison unjustly, only to discover that you know, he really was not the murderer and have everyone else know it too, but knowing he cannot get out, he says to his friend played by Morgan Freeman, I guess it just comes down to a simple choice really. Get busy living or get busy dying. For him, for that character, it was the mantra that kept him going. Why he would work on rocks in his spare time to create a chess set. Why he would develop a library to educate those inmates who had little to no education. He basically lived a life that said you've got two options. He, being unjustly accused and unjustly imprisoned, could decide to sit and to just die and get busy doing it, or he could get busy continuing to live life. Of course, Andy had made that decision. And then when he has his jailbreak, he makes it even more so. But the reason he says that to his friend Red is because Red needs to know that. His friend was the one who said, you shouldn't have hope in this place. Hope is a dangerous thing. And Andy says, if we haven't got hope, what have we got? As followers of Christ, the temple doesn't maybe look like Solomon had. But God is still at work in the temple. God is still busy in our lives. 
God is still telling us it is time to get busy living for me or just get busy dying for ourselves. Haggai knew what he was talking about because God knew what he was talking about. May we and may you and I decide that those weren't just the days. These are the days here and now to get busy living in Christ rather than waiting to die in him. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord God, hear our prayer this morning. Our prayer that simply says, you are not done with us. We know that. Because God, you reach in the midst of people who've been through such calamities. Here in your word we read of exile and people abandoned and sent to a foreign land for most of their lifetime, if not all of their lifetime. And now they come home to find your glory, not what it was or what they'd even heard about. But Lord, you are still making glory as you still were leading through the breath of your Holy Spirit. Breathe in us, O oh Lord, and build within us the holy presence of a temple. The body we've been given, the temple of the Lord, for we are one in the body of Christ. Amen.
Jesus gathered with his disciples the night that he was betrayed and he took the Passover meal and taking the bread from the table he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and told them this is my body which is broken for you eat that the people who make up the body of Christ join me in prayer Holy God, we come before you a broken people in a broken world and confess we have ignored yet again your assured presence. We have forged our own paths and chartered our own waters. In the name of independence, we have ignored your aid. We have called upon you in desperation. Forgive us, Lord. You have been with us in exile and liberation. Be with us even now. Amen. As Jesus had done with the bread, he took the cup from the table and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples. And he told them, this is my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As they would leave that evening, they would sing a psalm a song and they would adjourn to the garden to pray I invite you to join as David leads us all to stand and join together in the singing of the first verse of our song of being the temple and body of Christ blessed be the time Bless me, heart.